Let me set the scene for you guys real quick. Quinn and I had just finished dinner, and we sat down to talking about an array of topics, ranging from practice earlier that day to all the homework we still had left to do. And through these conversations, I had noticed that Quentin had left his yearbook out on his table. And being the nosy person that I am, looked through it. Quentin began sharing his high school experiences with me and had a sudden realization. I realized that I'd graduated with 200 students. And of the 200, only 38 went away to college. And as of October, when this conversation took place, uh, only 17 remained. And when I came to Denison, I thought that that was the norm. But since I've been here, I've realized that majority of high schools actually send majority of their students away to college. And this is weighed on my mind a lot more than it probably should, but I wanted to know why. What made that 8.5% stay in college? This question of why drove Quentin and I to wonder what held people back from becoming the best they could be. Was it their education they received? Was it their economic standing? Or was it just pure chance? And so we began to sketch a spectrum based off a number of different variables. And once we had this all on paper, we had many conversations with students and professors on campus. And through these conversations, we were introduced to a French sociologist and anthropologist by the name of Pierre Bordeaux. Bordeaux's theory of cultural capital in particular, which we will discuss now. All right, now as you can see, this is Bordeaux's theory of cultural capital, and it's broken down into four quadrants, which we will discuss now. First is the elite. These are people that are economically and culturally rich. An example would be celebrities. Moving on, we have the nouveau riche. People in this category are economically rich, but culturally poor. Someone you would deem as snooty or too good for others. Next, we have the intellectuals. These are people that are economically poor, but culturally rich. An example would be artists who are not well established. And finally, we have the dispossessed. These people are both economically and culturally poor. People in this category are generally poverty stricken and haven't really progressed far into life. Harsh, isn't it? the defining and labeling of individuals in a society based solely off their economic and cultural means? So immediately, Luke and I had a few issues with this theory. First, there was no transition. Once you were placed into a category, you were pretty much there for the entirety of your life. Next, Bordeaux's theory of cultural capital is just that. It's only based on cultural and capital means. And third and most important, there's no solution. There's no middle ground or room for an ideal person. So what we wanted to do is break the rigidness of this theory to kind of introduce our own theory, a new and improved social theory. To break the rigidness of this quadrant model, as you could see, we introduce our own model, a pyramid model, with five different categories ranging from benighted to egotistical. To begin, we will start with an example. All right, so this is Sean Hunter. Sean Hunter was born into a lower class family, but was always surrounded by supportive friends. However, he was unable to translate the success to his education as a result, he never met his full potential. Sean's an example of someone who is benighted. And those who are benighted are usually uneducated and economically limited. Furthermore, those who are benighted are ignorant of the other side of the pyramid. Speaking of the opposite side of the pyramid, this guy looks familiar, right? <laughs> Justin Bieber. Bieber is a perfect example of someone in the egotistical category, often exhibiting reckless behavior and primarily concerned with themselves. People in this category have a high economic value and put themselves on a pedestal so they cannot see anyone else below them. All right, I think we all know the kid in high school who had the potential to go on and be great in whatever he decided to do, but for some reason was never able to meet that full potential. So here's an example, Drake Bell. Drake Bell was born into a working class family and again, thrived at social skills, but was unable to translate the success to his education. As a result, he never met his full potential. He's an example of someone who is apathetic. Now, those who are apathetic are usually more economically stable, but are still ignorant of the other side of the pyramid and are still unable to meet their full potential somewhat. Now, before we move on to the next category, I want you guys to imagine something with me. Imagine that kid who stayed home to get a little extra studying done that missed out on the state championship basketball game that their team won. This is someone we would deem as narcissistic. Enter Regina George. Everyone's favorite mean girl. Regina is the perfect example of someone in the narcissistic category, often concerned with what others can do for her and not what she can do for others. People in this category generally have a high economic value similar to the e egotistical category, but are not influenced enough by their environment. So we focus so much on the negative 
that we think it's time to you know, kind of focus on the positive and introduce this idea of an ideal person. Now, it's important to note that the previous categories all had guidelines, but the ideal person doesn't necessarily have guidelines. Ideal people are few and far between. What we want to do is give a face with someone who would be ideal. And it's also important to note that the ideal person can come from either side of the pyramid. Now, this is Oprah Winfrey, the example of an ideal person. Oprah is a classic rags to riches story. She was born to an unmarried teenage mother in Mississippi. At that point, she was benighted as she faced constant poverty with a consistent change of environment. Oprah became apathetic as she rose to the top of her high school class, eventually graduating from Tennessee State University, becoming the first female African-American reporter. Oprah's popularity grew along with her charitable initiatives. Without forgetting where she came from, she became an ideal person. And moving on, we have William Henry Gates III, or as you guys may know him, Bill Gates. Bill Gates was born into a very affluent family, starting out his life in the egotistical category. Growing up, he attended many of the world's most finest private education institutions and had many of his perspectives shaped by his wonderful parents, William Gates Jr. and Mary Maxwell Gates. He is now seen as narcissistic. Taking these perspectives he gained as a child, translating them into success, he is consistently named in the Forbes Most Wealthiest Person list, while subsequently being named one of the world's most philanthropic people. Thus, ending as the ideal person, Bill has found himself in an equilibrium between where he came from and what he came from. So now you're thinking, how do we determine where everyone fits on the pyramid? Well, the answer is in one word, pride. We decided that pride is the only thing limiting you from transition and advancing throughout the pyramid. It is important to note that before we discuss these five subcategories, they are in no order of importance or value. So the five elements of, elements of pride. The first, wealth. While wealth doesn't fully determine your place on the pyramid, it would be foolish not to mention it. Wealth can give you access to better education and better resources. And wealth can also give you the opportunity to give back to others. However, wealth can affect you negatively if you become too proud of what you have. Moving on, we have aspirations, or the drive you have to be the best you can potentially be. Without aspirations, no other values have any significance on one's pride. Next, work ethic. Work ethic is what determines if you will meet your full potential. Work ethic is how likely you are to give 100% or full effort to whatever you decide to do. It's also important to note that work ethic does not only affect your pride positively, but negatively as well. It has the option of both. And moving on, we have upbringing. And this is more than just the parenting you received. This is the schools you attended, the friends you had, the activities you participated in. This could be your grandparents, your exposure to different environments, or the places you've been. And similarly to work ethic, upbringing can have both a positive and negative effect on one's pride. Finally, social skills, or how well you communicate with others. Now the truth of the matter is that social skills only come about through practice. Social skills are important in instilling community values with you, also establishing better connections for the future. So now that we've laid out the five elements of pride, you can see that this is how we've kind of placed people on this pyramid. So why? Why have we, two random college students, stood here and thrown all this information at you? Some of it harsh, some of it enlightening. Well, the fact of the matter is, not everyone can be an ideal person right now. You don't see yourself as the ideal person. We all would like to think of ourselves as ideal, but the truth of the matter is we can all look to ourselves to reflect and improve. We want to educate the millions of people who have not yet reached their full potential. Right now, right this very second, for the first time, you have the ability to define yourself without regard to anyone else's input. We want you to know that if you're not happy with where you see yourself on the pyramid, you can change. We need people with community values who can envision global change, but we also need people with the resources to create that change. We want to build a more conscientious society where individuals see themselves as part of something much, much bigger, something that will forever define our generation. A, a real, real utopia. utopia.